Welcome to another edition of Our City. A few things going around the city of Elizabeth this week. On Tuesday, May 3rd, I'm going to attend the Haitian Heritage Art Exhibit, which is held at the main library on Broad Street. We will all be celebrating Haitian Heritage Month through an artistic lens where art, music, and dance will be exhibited all month long. For more information, you can visit the public library at their website, elizpl.org. On Wednesday, May 4th, we will be raising the Mexican flag in front of City Hall in honor of Cinco de Mayo. I recognize it's May 4th and Cinco de Mayo is May 5th. It just turns out this is when it fits the schedule. On May 4th, we'll be joining the Elizabeth Destination Marketing Organization for National Tourism Week at the Elizabeth Marina. People will have a chance to board the Atlantis for a two-hour tour experience in New York City, uh, not only through the Arthur Kill, but up into the East River. And for more information, you can go visit the website, goelizabethnj.org. And keep in mind, the City of Elizabeth and the County of Union, we still have plenty of vaccines available. You can just go to ucnjvaccine.org or the City of Elizabeth website at elizabethnj.org or any of our social media sites for more information. We should still continue to get vaccinated following the social distance rules. Wear your face mask or covering if you're in crowded places and you're not sure the vaccination status of the people that you're with. Keep in mind that personal responsibility through this pandemic is extremely important. And if you need any other information, you can call our public information office at 908-820-4124. First of all, I want to thank our guests for being here today. First, Ms. Carol Savona, who is the president of Future City. Carol, welcome. Thank you. And Ms. Robina Seguir, who is a biology teacher and joining us for Environmental Week. Robina, welcome. Thank you. And Kate Boycott from the Environmental Defense Fund. Kate, welcome to the show. Thank you for having me. So why don't we start, uh, how are you all doing? And you can provide some introduction to our residents on who exactly you are and why you're doing this for Environmental Week. And Kate, since you're on the screen, we'll start with you. Well, thank you again for, for having us. Uh, a little bit about Environmental Defense Fund and what I'm doing here. We actually, we work globally, nationally on linking science, economics, law, private sector, and community partnerships to really tackle solutions to all sorts of environmental problems from climate change to, to pollution and, and more. I focus particularly on flooding, really the impacts of climate change on our communities. And uh, that's part of the reason why I'm here today uh, and also having a longstanding partnership uh, with, with Future City and, and having connected with you. So thanks again. Thank you for joining us, Kate. And uh, Carol, uh, since Kate mentioned Super City, we'll, uh, Future City, we'll go with you next. Uh, we've worked together for a long time in your role at Future City. You retired from the Elizabeth schools. Tell us about yourself. What are you doing? Yes, I've been working with Future City for almost 20 years. And it's an environmental nonprofit right here in Elizabeth. And uh, we'll be celebrating 25 years as an organization in the fall. We're really proud of that. I'm also the retired science teacher and coach with the Elizabeth Board of Ed. And I had family ties to Elizabeth when I was a kid. So I've spent a lot of time in Elizabeth, and I'm really interested in what, what goes on here. Well, Carol, we thank you for all of your volunteer hours. It is, it is well appreciated. Thank you. And, Rabina, I saved you for last because I was such a great biology student. Just kidding, Rabina. Tell us a little bit about yourself and how you're doing with the, the students at Elizabeth in biology. So I'm Rabina Seguir. And I teach biology and environmental science at Thomas Jefferson Arts Academy. This is actually, this is my 20th year uh, teaching there. Um, and we had like a really successful week um, in collaboration with uh, Future City, uh, just making the students aware of like all the environmental issues during the environmental week. Thank you. And Carol, you know, this is our 22nd Environmental Week, and Future City has always played a role 
in Environmental Week. Tell us how it's changed over the last 22 years and how it has grown. Well, Environmental Week began as Environmental Day years ago. And um, it's evolved over the years. And it was started as a way to get information to a small group of students and then grew to where we met at Peters Town Center or at the waterfront with, we had a series of workshops where um, several hundred students would come in person. And we had partners such as the Army Corps of Engineers, the Coast Guard, the New York, New Jersey Baykeeper, various universities, Future City, the City of Elizabeth, the Board of Ed. We had a lot of people who, who uh, took part in these events. And um, after the pandemic, we had to go virtual. And that was, um, we missed seeing the kids in person, but it had an added advantage of being able to reach thousands instead of hundreds of students. Carol, tell us about the, the partners and how they've responded to the progression in their workshops with the students. How have they uh, moved on and grown with that process, especially the virtual work? Oh, our partners uh, keep the information up to date and they constantly impress on the students that they individually can make a difference. Accurate information and ways to deal with problems are important ways in getting students involved. The climate is changing at a more rapid pace than we thought. And the future of these students will be impacted by the decisions that they make. So we wanna really get them invested in their own future. And, and Rabina, can you provide us with a review of the week and what the remote workshop partners did in the science classes? So this was like a really successful week of like uh, imparting information to the students. Now, it didn't just give students the information of all the environmental issues, but it also had like set of questions after each session. And then at the end, they were like, a questionnaire kind of a thing where they it, it had just simple yes or no answers. It was like a kind of self-evaluation for the kids to realize whether, you know, like walk, whether walking to a corner store is better for them or better for the environment or riding in a car. So by evaluating each of their acts, they could like identify which act was more environmentally friendly and which wasn't. So I think the, the whole purpose of all this was to create awareness in our students. And we were pretty successful in doing that. So how many kids picked the car, Rabina? Uh, so I did not see the, because I think Carol might have seen the results, but um, in the classes, I think there were quite a few who picked cars. But then they realized that um, it might not be the right answer and then changed it. So, Kate, you know, the workshop information, especially over the last two years in virtual, has been somewhat difficult, but reach, we reach more students that way. Can you talk about a public policy perspective and why is that so important in dealing with these workshops? Yeah, and and I think there's there's obviously there are a lot of negatives to that virtual, but I think there are some positives, and I'll I'll, I'll name a, a couple. But I think you you know better than I, as an elected official, that good pub public policy comes from an informed and engaged uh, community and in partnership with with those that make decisions. And I think what Rubina and and Carol's work on on getting these workshops together have done is really given students some of those tools to think critically about how, how we can maybe be part of the solution to a lot of these big challenges. So whether it's uh, choosing the walk over the car or recognizing that maybe there are other things that even go beyond our own individual actions that maybe we can get a little bit more involved and engaged in changing. I think that it's just a really great laying of the groundwork for that kind of engagement. So Kate, when you talk about public policy, you're way too young, except Carol might remember. The, the commercial back in the 60s with the Indian crying on the road when the car would drive by and throw litter out. I was a young boy at that time. I thought that had a great impact on me. But then again, there's a lot, 
there's a lot more avenues now for for the media to get the word out. But that was kind of a captive audience. And I remember, do you remember that or did you ever see it? It was a pretty moving commercial uh, directing young people to a public policy issue. Yeah, and I think I think in the sense that we we need those messages that connect us and and sort of help drive us towards action. That's really important. Um, I think you know also recognizing that like like we were just talking about, there are things that individually we can do, but there's also reasons that maybe we need to come together to to make larger action. And I think um, climate change is one very big example of that. And we've seen many of the youth of the ages that uh, Rubina is teaching coming together and advocating for uh, changes to how we deal with greenhouse gases in this country and beyond. And that is frankly inspiring. I didn't get that engaged as a high school student. And so I'm inspired every day by a lot of the students that are um, kind of doing that and making making some of those messages for us. I think there's actually a lot they're doing on social media to reach everybody, uh, including their parents. So, Robina, uh, Kate raises a good point on the perspective of the role of an educator. How do you get that message that Kate just spoke about across to your students? So... Like Kate said, that in, in informed, we have to have informed public to like take care of our environmental health. They have to recognize that there are environmental issues first. And um, I think by attending these workshops, the students become aware of all the issues, but at the same time, the purpose should not be of like scaring them with like talking about, um, there are naturally uh, the climate change is causing um, like storms and hurricanes and flooding and all this, but also for them to identify that we don't have to look for something big to happen, some big reforms to come. Each one of us is individually responsible for doing our part. And once the students understand they are as they specifically, because they are the ones who are going to be uh, solving all these uh, environmental issues later on in life. So for them to be aware and know and understand that each one of them is responsible for taking care of the environmental health. It's, you know, reforms would come and they should, but each one of us has a role to play as well. So Carol, you started teaching way before climate change was on the lips of the students. How do you think students progress from here? And how do you get the word out locally to residents as well. What are the next steps? Oh, for me, um, I, I agree with uh, Rubina. We don't want to scare people, but due to storms like Hurricane Ida that made landfall in the US and the Gulf of Mexico, but did more damage here in the North, mm -hmm. people in Elizabeth finally realized that devastation can be real. You know, usually it's somewhere else. It isn't, it isn't somewhere else. This local in my backyard realization often moves people to action. We're trying to get people involved in their future. And when they know, when they actually know people that are impacted by bad climate changes, they're more apt to get involved with trying to solve problems. Thank you, Carol. Uh, <clears throat> Kate, climate change, if you remember, started off as global warming. And how do we create a culture of resilience locally when we really get off on the wrong foot on the wording of the message? Yeah, so I, I think I, I really loved what Rubina said about sort of everybody plays a part. And I think that, you know, we, we, we do know and it's, it's good to acknowledge that these are big challenges. I think we do need to be aware of that. We have like we saw with Ida, we we've received 40% more rain than in the 2050 and sorry in the 1950s. So uh, we have tons of, of rain. We have uh, risen sea levels. These are real things that we do need to be aware of. But at the same time, uh, people feel really alienated. Uh, like Rubina said, you know, if if we aren't aware of the actions that we can take to to deal with this problem, it's not unsolvable. 
and we have the power to do it. We just need to figure out what everybody's going to do. So I think at the individual level, um, you know, really being aware of the the kinds of messaging that that Rubina is sending to educate kids about climate change, that can help us make decisions uh, about you know paying attention to the weather report knowing what whether we live in a flood plain or not and and knowing whether or not we might need to, to maybe um, move something in our in our house or, or go to a higher floor or if that's an option you know really trying to to think about what to do in the case of a storm but more proactively also working with our town planners working with um, those that make decisions in in our communities about sort of you know how do we how do we deal with this problem there are some actual solutions to it and and part of that is is engaging uh, as a community member and vice versa so that we can kind of figure out what we're going to do together to deal with these this changing environment and for for all of you by the way how do we transfer what kate and rabina and Kara were saying into more of a regional information and understanding the policy because kate you raise a good point follow the weather stations if you live in a floodplain but they, there may be other cities who are never impacted by any of this. And how do we convince those cities that this issue of climate change and information and policy is extremely important? Let's we'll start with you, Kate. Yeah, I mean, I actually think that, that Ida <laughs> showed us that it's not just the coast. I think a lot of people think that uh, you know, it's the Jersey Shore or something like that, that it's it's uh, sort of wealthy homes and second homes and uh, certain communities and somewhere else. And I think Ida showed us that that's not the case. But you're right, there, there are some places, um, I would say very few at this point that are not receiving some level of impact. Even last summer after the fires out west, the sky was orange in New York and New Jersey for a day because we had some of that um, remaining ash from from those fires, you know, many many miles away, impacting our our air quality. So I think that people are are starting to get a sense of that. The way that that we do that, I think, is is coming together. Environmental Defense Fund is part of. We we have a lot of members that take a lot of actions with us, but we are also part of a, a, several coalitions, including the Rise to Resilience Coalition, which operates regionally, includes New York, Northern New Jersey. And they're tracking and making an impact on federal, state, and, and local policy in both states. Um, and that's that's because they, they've come together to be aware of and impact those, those policies that might mean something uh, gets built to deal with some flooding in their neighborhood or, or not, um, or that policies that impact um, flooding are, are you know pass or not. So those are those are some ways that you can get involved or going to a town meeting about plan the, any planning that's going on in your neighborhood or, or maybe getting involved in a coalition like Rise to Resilience or other other means. Thank you, Kate. It, Rubina, how do you get the students, no matter where they come from, to understand that climate change affects all of us, uh, like Kate was talking about with the red skies? How, how do we convince students that are never affected visually that it's still serious? So, like Kate said, that the impacts of the fire were felt in New York. The students have to, like, they have to be, uh, they have to understand that we share. It seems like specifically the water and the air. It's almost like we are all sh sharing it. It's like just like that, and it's not just in the U.S. Actually, it is global, and the impacts are felt globally because any. Uh, natural disaster that happens like somewhere in US is going to one way or other impact all of us. And slowly and gradually, if they keep on happening more often, the impacts are going to be felt all over the world. And Carol, the students, do you see a change in feedback in the students over the years? In a change of um, the way the students think? Yes. Uh, definitely, because um, you know, back in the back in the fifties when I was a kid, we didn't know what was going on anywhere else. Now it's on the news every day. We we see what's happening and we see that it it can happen to us now. So students are getting much more involved. We we see young young students, grade school students, and high school students getting involved in environmental issues, and that makes us really happy. 
you know, they're coming out to to do cleanups and they're they're getting involved and they're they're thinking about what they can do to help help the environment. So I understand I have some impressive hikers on the show. Kate is one of them. I don't know, Rabina, Carol, you're hikers as well. We'll, we'll start with Kate. Do you see the climate change during your travails in in hiking? Um, sorry, so do, do I see the impacts of climate change from getting outside and, and, and yeah. Um, yeah, and unfortunately, but I, I think there's, again, I'll, I'll talk both about the positive and the negative. Um, for sure, I've, I've seen the impacts of, um, of a changing climate when going hiking and, and seeing a huge influx of a particular type of caterpillar defoliating the trees um, in one area where I was getting rained on from just thousands of caterpillars. And part of that has to do with uh, changing timing that, that benefits sort of certain species over others in other areas. Um, but I want to talk just briefly about the, the positives of, of really investing in our outdoor spaces and green infrastructure, whether that's, you know, some park far away or really just the trees in our, in our neighborhoods. Um, they provide refuge to us when it's hotter. So it's really important to think about, um, you know, if we're, if we're making a decision on how to manage, say, a lot of increased rain, um, thinking about solutions like a grain garden or trees that benefit all of us when we go for a walk. It reduces the heat outside. Um, and there's also a lot of research that shows that spending time in green spaces and healthy green spaces actually has a lot of mental health benefits. So I think, um, you know, just focusing on the solutions side, uh, investing in these green spaces um, and, and plants in our, in our communities can really help um, reap multiple benefits while dealing with a, a major challenge. Plant a tree, right? Plant some trees. Yes, yes, yes. natural things. <laughs> I, so we're out of time. I wanna thank the three of you for joining us on the show. We really appreciate your insight and your work with the students and Kate, your work with the Defense Fund. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. You're welcome. I wanna thank Ms. Carol Savona, Ms. Rubina Seguir, and Ms. Kate Boycott for joining me on this week of Our City. I'm Mayor Chris Bolwage. We'll see you next week on another edition.